buildings. The linear shaped charge. It's a, a chevron shaped or V-shaped charge that you can focus at a specific target and uh, it's lethal. It generates uh, around three million pounds per square inch pressure uh, at a speed, depending on the explosive inside the shape charge, in excess of 27,000 feet per second. Well, that ought to do it. Let's take a look and see if there's any evidence of those shape charges. Were the underground explosions intended to blow out the Twin Towers' basements, followed by blasts heard inside the buildings of shape charges slicing the core? Demolition pre-weakening usually takes place well in advance of the final blast, but at the World Trade Center, critical prep work might have had to occur in a very compressed time frame in the panicked aftermath of the plane strikes. These core columns were discovered after the collapse. The angled cut occurs in exactly the manner that shaped charges slice through steel beams to control the way they fall. Notice the hardened once liquid metal. Was thermite used with the shape charge? The job of the shape charge is to cut steel H-beams. The way we do this is by cutting the beam at an angle which, through a series of beams cut at the same angle, will tend to make the building shift over and walk. And that angle is seen on many of the steel columns and beams at the World Trade Center that were cleaned up, as you can see on the right side over here. The iron workers out there, including John Feel, who get, get those charges placed without anybody knowing it. Well, th this is a floor plan of the World Trade Center. We blow up, or enlarge, if you will, <laughs> the core. And um, you can see that each of these elevator shafts are immediately adjacent to a core column, certainly on the lower floors. And on the upper floors, uh, there's fewer elevators. Uh, but uh, the other interesting note is that uh, ACE Elevator had a modernization going on the nine months prior to 9-11. So it would have been relatively easy for them to uh, have complete access throughout the building to the core columns without being detected other than of course by security which we know was taken over by Securicom which has a curious set of relationships on its board of directors okay I'll tell you Marvin Bush and Wirt Walker another Bush cousin uh, nevertheless uh, if you had access to security you would have then been able to cut through the gypsum board hoistway and get into the, and also cut through the fireproofing, which was gypsum board also, around each of the core columns to set these charges. In other words, it would have been uh, very doable in the months prior to 9-11, particularly with wireless detonation, which is common in the industry. So again, you just have to stop and ask yourself some fairly intuitive things after you are exposed to this. Is this a collapse or is this an explosion? It's an intuitive question that you can show these things to people uh, after they're, uh, this, is, this, is, this is an extraordinary one. The leading edge of all of the material is the beams, which were blown out and go the farthest because they have the most the most mass they're, they're, they're carried. Well, actually, the, the aluminum cladding went even further. We're talking about a 1,200 foot diameter debris field, everything being blown out at once, cut to 30 foot or so lengths. That's very important because that enables them to be loaded on the trucks. There's 2,700 people losing their lives, 340 firemen. In, in, in this photograph, real time, if you will, how do we honor them? Do we honor them by sweeping us under the rug or by getting at the truth of what their murder, what their process of murdering was and, and who their murderers were? I say we get at the truth. And that's how we honor them. Don't let anybody tell you. <clears throat> that you're upsetting the families. The families need to be upset if the truth, if they're going to get at the truth. And it's the, it's the families being upset 
that will get the rest of our country woken up and, and getting at the truth as well. It's, it's upsetting to all of us. That's no reason not to strike to the heart of the truth of the matter. It'll happen again. The reason w many of us are so furious in our effort to educate the rest of America and the world about this is because the next 9-11, we're being told, is going to be greater, more devastating, and the impacts on our freedoms, on our culture, on our way of life, uh, and not to mention additional wars, are going to be even greater. So it's critical that we all do our part. Let's take our first look at the World Trade Center North Tower collapse, if you will. You see a lot of smoke, and you're going to see a lot of explosions up at the top of the building, right there, and over here as well. And really soon, you're going to see this, this part come down and shorten to about here before it goes down. In other words, there's about 12 or 15 floors that are being destroyed right here before any gravitational collapse, if you will, which would have occurred at the point of jet plane impact and then gone down. This completely refutes the official story. In addition, the antenna drops 12 feet prior to the collapse of the building, indicating core column damage uh, is what started it, not perimeter column damage, which is what we're being told. <clears throat> Here you can see the North Tower. Howard, are you up there? Can you turn my uh, microphone up a little bit? I'm losing my voice. Thanks. Here you can see the North Tower already underway, and you can see these belts of explosions that the firemen saw and heard, as they said, all the way around the building. This is not a characteristic of fire. Uh, all, again, all those columns being cut uh, and destroyed at once. That's helpful. Thanks, Howard. Oh. You see new fuel sources, you see squibs, which we're going to be getting at. <clears throat> and this one shows the series of violent explosions in this close-up. And additional squibs uh, underneath. You'll see it a couple of times in different, in different ways. Very violent, individual explosions. Very, very powerful uh, video. Do we have demolition waves removing the columns all at once? Appearing to fall away from the rest of the building. Can we go to the tape now? Here we go, right here. This is, I mean, when you look at it. Now, that building is already at this angle. What we're told is, is that uh, it, the, the, the collapse point, the, the impact point here, 40 stories above, what happened was it starts to lean over, right? Which is we'd expect it to do. And we would expect it, therefore, then to go all the way down to the ground as, a, as a some mass that's visible, but it doesn't do that. It disappears into this cloud, its angular momentum is halted, and it, it's completely gone, and then from there, all you see is the building tearing itself apart, and that's more apparent in the other views. Like this one, where's the pile driver that's pushing the, the rest of the building down? Not there. We'll talk about these squibs in a moment. Here you can see the independent explosions. Again, very, very violent. By the way, how many of you have never seen a top-down controlled demolition? Uh, here's one uh, in a reading grain. There, you can't say they don't have top-down controlled demolitions now. Um, that's in the for what it's worth column. You don't have to have a precedent to do something new. Do we have a free fall speed Galileo's of collapse? Galileo's law of falling bodies calculates the time in which an object will travel a certain distance in complete free fall. Distance, D, equals 16.8 times time in seconds squared. The South Tower was 1,362 feet tall. 1362 equals 16.08 times 84.7, or 9.2 seconds. Black smoke on top of white smoke. There are two different colors of smoke. Um, the Twin Towers came down in nearly free fall speed. 
Ask me that question and then answer it, because I actually don't know what the, what the answer is. So virtually free fall speed. What are we talking about? Folks, we're talking about a 20-story building that's going to be dropped with nothing underneath it versus a 20-story building that's got to crush 80,000 tons of structural steel designed to resist that load. Which one's going to hit the ground first? How many say this one? Most of you. Anybody say this one? Both of them hit the ground first on 9-11. That is to say, we're told that 80,000 tons of structural steel gave no resistance, and that's perfectly natural. That's sixth grade physics. Um, that is to say, your understanding that that is not the case is, comes from your intuitive understanding. You, people ask me, what can I say? I'm not an architect, an engineer, a scientist, a controlled demolitions expert. You, did, any, did you graduate from the sixth grade? Just show them this, this slide. By the way, you can buy this DVD back there. Um, and, and show people this information, it, it's critical. It, we're, it doesn't make any sense. Two equally skilled runners, one has, to, uh, one has to go through 110 layers of saran wrap, you know, whatever it is, it's gonna slow him down somewhat. Not on 9-11. The law of the conservation of momentum says that when a falling body is impacted, it, it transfers its inertia to the next floor and on and on and on. That takes some time. That time can be calculated to somewhere between 10, uh, 15, 20, 30 seconds, but not virtually free fall speed, as we're told. Where is the pile driver? You don't see it in any of the videos after four seconds. It's shredded itself, and then the building tears itself apart. Let's take a look at these squibs, which are very important sets of evidence. In all the videos of the collapses, explosions can be seen. Thank you, Loose Change, for their incredible work also. Great work. <clears throat> Bursting from the building 20 to 30 stories below the demolition wave. Here. 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 These guys are good. They go on and on. But I'm going to cut to the chase. NIST, the National Institute of Science and Techno Standards and Technology, says that these squibs are puffs of air being produced by the, L the, the pile driver, which we've seen doesn't even exist, right? But it, the pile driver is pushing this air down, coming down through the elevator shafts and whooshing out into uh, the building and going out through the, the windows. Well, there's a few problems with this. First of all, these are not puffs of air. They're, they're, they're pulverized building materials, columns you can even see in them. And second of all, they occur, because we have the videos, you can calculate the speed. It's uh, over 160 feet per second. These are explosive speeds. Third, if there was a, an elevator shaft, like say behind me, and the air came whooshing out, and it, remember, this is open office space, most all of it, and it would fill this air relatively, th this space uniformly with pressure, and then what would it do? It would blow out Several windows, if, if at all, if any. Not highly particular focalized explosions at mostly the exact center uh, between the corners of the buildings. So there's some real problems with some of these explanations. Again, we have a 1,200 foot uh, perimeter column. 45, 40 to, 45 to 55 miles per hour exit speed of these beams going uh, 500 feet laterally. In fact, here's the debris field. You can see uh, Building 7 right here, nice neat pile, classic controlled demolition, and then you see the World Trade Center where everything is blown outside the footprint. What footprint? You say you can't find it. Here it is. That's the footprint of the North and South Towers. There's as much stuff outside of it, that is to say the height, uh, uh, as, as, as inside of it. It's a, it's a hollow smoking crater. This is a seven-story lobby, which you have two or three stories of stuff, that stuff being primarily steel concrete, steel beams and, and, uh, and aluminum cladding. Uh, what happened to all the floors? Oh yeah, this was a pancake collapse. We're supposed to have 110 floors.
Okay, this is the metal decking that was on each floor, right? An acre in size. That's uh, some, something like the size of this building with four inches of concrete in, in, around the perimeter where the floor trusses were, five inches of reinforced concrete inside where the core was. How many of you would expect to see maybe half the floors? There was some kinetic energy, right? Gravitational potential destroyed some of these floors maybe. Uh, 110 of them, all 110? I don't think so. I would expect to see a few of them down at the bottom. We don't see any. Okay, they're all gone. Where did they go? Well, we're going we're to find out in, in, in a minute. This is a pancake collapse in Mexico. You see floors, you see pancakes. Uh, they're not reduced to powder and dust, as we'll see. The steel skeleton is broken up and ready for shipment. Convenient 30-foot lengths. Now, here's the most interesting part. The World Trade Center structural engineer Leslie Robertson himself says at this National Conference of Structural Engineers, as of 21 days after the attack, molten steel was still running. Is he a credible witness? Is he lying? Not at this point. Chief O'Toole. So, so, uh, February, seeing a crane lifting a steel beam vertically from deep within the catacombs of Ground Zero. It was dripping with molten steel. Is he a credible witness? Is he lying? I don't think so. How about the controlled, how, how, how about the, the company that was hired to clean this up? Uh, in this case, Mark Loiseau. Mark Loiseau, the president of Controlled Demolition Incorporated, told the American Free Press that in the basements of the World Trade Center, where 47 central support columns connected to the bedrock, Hot spots of literally molten steel were discovered more than a month after September 11th. These incredibly hot areas were found at the bottoms of the elevator shafts, down seven basement levels. The molten steel was found three, four, and five weeks later when the rubble was being removed. He said that molten steel was also found at World Trade Center 7. The highest temperature was in the east corner of the South Tower, where a temperature of 1,377 degrees Fahrenheit was recorded. The molten steel in the basement was more than double that temperature. So here's that graph that he's talking about. This is building seven in the upper right, 1,340 degrees on the surface. They're not measuring six stories down where all the liquid molten metal was running. That was easily two, three, four times as hot. Also in the, in the World Trade Center 7. Here's a photo of it. It does a photo lie that you can tell by the color of this material that it's picking up what its temperature is. Now fires are 12, 1400 degrees at the max. NIST claims 1800 degrees. I'll give that to them even though there's no evidence as I mentioned of uh, temperatures over five or six, four or five, 600 degrees in the Twin Towers. Uh, when, it, when, it, when we're salmon color, we know it's at least 1500 degrees. And there, there it is, salmon color. Lemon, 1800 degrees. Structural steel doesn't even begin to melt until 2,700 degrees. We're missing over 1,000 degrees of temperature or a heat source. The official story, as you'll see, claims there was no molten metal. Only one, well, one that I'm aware of uh, that, that seems to fit the rest of the evidence that you're going to see. Uh, thermite, or th thermite or thermate creates 4,000 degree temperatures. What's its byproduct? Molten metal. We'll be taking a close look at that. Here's the liquid metal falling. Now, if, if molten metal is, this is, this is the test of the day. You, you kind of need to understand this. If molten metal, uh, if steel doesn't even begin to melt till 2700 degrees, and the temperatures by the color we can see are yellow and salmon, 15, 1800 degrees, what's creating its liquid state? The introduction of sulfur into the th aluminothermic reaction, which lowers the melting point of steel significantly, creating much more effective uh, incendiary. We'll, uh, we have a very, very, very special and honored guest who will explain some of those things to us, Dr. Stephen Jones from Brigham Young University, in a moment. Well, actually, after dinner. We have to wait. I, I don't even know how I can wait. S you can't wait either. Fires burned and molten metal flowed in the pile of ruins still settling beneath my feet. Sarah Atlas. Here's Bart Vorsanger, architect hired to create, to find uh, artifacts from, uh, from the, the, the World Trade Center site. 
Unusual artifacts to emerge from the rubble is this rock-like object that has come to be known as the meteorite. This this fused element of of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat into one single element. Is he a credible witness? Say yes, he's an architect. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now this uh, other multi-ton chunk of, of, of previously molten stuff with uh, reinforcing and all fused, it, it, is it aluminum? No. Uh, it's not a melted airplane because uh, aluminum Unusual doesn't rust. So what in the world is this stuff? Well, uh, the, I, can, I can tell you what John Gross, the lead engineer of the NIST uh, uh, says about it. In fact, we'll let, we'll let him tell you himself. I'm curious about uh, the, uh, the pool of molten steel that was found in the bottom of the, of the towers. Um, I, I am too. And <laughs> please tell me about it. You, have you seen it? Why? Well, not personally, but my witnesses there found huge poles of molten steel beneath the towers. And uh, scientists, some scientists don't think that the uh, collapse of the building could have melt, melted all that steel. And uh, uh, professor, physics professor analyzed some of the steel, and uh, Stephen Jones, and he found evidence of, uh, of thermate residue, mm -hmm. which would explain how the buildings collapsed by means of pre-planted explosives. So have you analyzed the, uh, the steel for uh, any of those residues? Um. First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. Uh, you'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, molten steel running down the channel rail. Uh, is he a credible witness? Is he a liar? No, I'm talking about the fireman. <laughs> uh, no, he's, he's not. Why does NIST need to lie through their teeth about the molten metal? Because the official story cannot explain it, doesn't explain it, never will explain it, and they're, they're caught with their pants down in this particular video. And, and, uh, and, and, and with all of the evidence that you've seen and much more uh, for molten metal, where does it come from? Let's, let's take a quick peek at uh, a preview of our after-dinner um, excitement. <laughs> An incendiary used by the military, thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. This is thermite melting the engine of a car. We know that open air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. The second product of a thermite reaction is aluminum oxide, visible as white smoke. Was thermite used in conjunction with explosives on September 11th? Watch this very bright substance pouring from the 81st floor of the South Tower. And white smoke appeared at the base of the building. Would this be aluminum oxide, the byproduct of a thermite reaction? Appendix C of the FEMA report describes sulfur residues on the World Trade Center steel. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron, and iron oxide and iron sulfide had formed on the surface of the structural steel. Sulfur used with thermite is called thermate, producing even faster results. That substance pouring off of the floor of the South Tower, we're told, is melted airplane substance. Uh, but of course, that substance is silvery in color, as is lead acid, from, or, uh, lead from the from batteries, which we're told were also up on that floor. In daylight conditions, it is indeed silvery. 
Uh, so FEMA talks about uh, severe high temperature corrosion attack on the steel, including oxidation and sulfidation. The, the firemen describe the ends of the beams as, as being melted. Uh, John Field also talks about this. A liquid eutectic mixture containing primarily oxygen and sulfur formed during this hot corrosion attack. Well, um, it causes intergranular melting, which fire does not do. Has your fireplace ever melted? And anybody? Uh, no. The, the official story also clarifies fire did not melt the steel. It softened it substantially, which turns out to be not true uh, in, in, in the case of the Twin Towers, as, as, as we'll see. Uh, but capable of turning a solid steel girder into Swiss cheese, what could do that? Uh, well, FEMA found the evidence for it. Did, what, what did NIST do with the evidence FEMA found? NIST came along, $3 million, $20 million, three-year investigation. They scrapped it. All of this evidence, which is key evidence, uh, sulfidation, sulfur, reducing the melting point of steel, key ingredient in thermate. This is a piece of steel from Building 7. Fire does not do this to steel. What else does fire not steel do? Steel in dragon-like lengths and contortions spoke for itself, bent, deformed, without cracks. I found it hard to believe that it actually bent because of the size of it and how there's no cracks in the iron. It bent without almost a single crack in it. It takes thousands of degrees to bend steel like this. Typically you'd have buckling and tearing on the tension side, but there's no buckling at all. There's no buckling at all. Lots of examples of these kinds of, of uh, deformed steel, which again takes thousands of degrees. Well, Dr. Jones is going to talk to you about uh, uh, his, his molten metal samples, which he, done, he has done chemical analysis on. I'll leave it uh, uh, up to you to, to, to leave it up to him to tell you exactly what he found. But he did indeed find that it's, uh, it's primarily iron, so it's not a melted airplane. It doesn't have chromium, so it's not structural steel. It's uh, the byproduct of an aluminothermic reaction, the classical byproduct, the... Uh, the uh, iron, he also analyzes this uh, slag, which he finds the trace elements of an aluminothermic reaction once again. Uh, iron, aluminum, sulfur, magnesium, and fluorine. Fluorine, of course, is the uh, oxidizer in aluminothermic reactions. I'm looking for a very special slide, which here. So, so the dust is also uh, analyzed. And, and here we have the, the dust sample sent to him, creating these tiny, in, in all the, the, the dust of the World Trade Center, he's, he's found, and others have found these. In fact, the USGS, uh, on behalf of EPA, finds in their dust analysis these small microspheres. Well, what could they be? And, and, and how, did, how, did, how did they have the exact proportion to a classic aluminothermic reaction with, with iron and aluminum and, and sulfur in the same proportions. Uh, that's, a, that's a secret that I'm going to also uh, have Dr. Jones talk to you about. It's corroborated. The, the USGS finds the same, same stuff. Now, w where could this come from? Uh, let's, let's take a look really quick. Before the Revolutionary War, they used to drop le molten lead from the top of these shot towers, and it would cool. And before it cooled, its surface tension formed into a perfect sphere, and they were able to use that in their muskets. And it would cool down at the bottom in a vat of water. So this is what happens if you had uh, thousands of aluminothermic reactions in the building that you saw the light sources for, and for a fraction of a second, a series of explosions uh, we don't know the, the exact source. It could very well be this super high-tech uh, thermate with nano-sized particles that could be responsible for this. Uh, indeed, we have some evidence uh, uh, to suggest that. And then you, you would have atomized all of this molten iron, and you'd, you'd thus have these spheres. Well, what did the EPA say? They, nothing. They just dropped it like a hot potato. 
but they do have the evidence there. These are the signature, these are the, the, the fingerprints that the criminal has left behind. There's enough evidence just right here to put these people away for a very long time for murder and treason. This information has to get out. This would also account for, for uh, toasting the tops of these cars, the highly corrosive uh, stuff. So, Dr. Jones, of course, concludes. Well, I'll let him tell you what he concludes. But again, buildings, we're going to look at the dust here. The buildings that uh, are destroyed by natural forces, uh, they don't pulverize to dust. Let's take a quick look. Uh, one of the most significant things to, to my thinking uh, uh, that indicates that this could not have been the sort of collapse that we are told it was is the presence of the dust clouds. Uh, and as you've seen in the pictures, and I'm sure all of us have, have uh, seen probably more than we would like, uh, there were very, very large clouds of very thick dust that enveloped the area that crossed the river that made it almost all the way to New Jersey from the pictures that I've seen. Uh, this type of flow is something that we are familiar with in physics. It occurs in only two situations that we know of naturally. Uh, one is in volcanic eruptions where a large amount of material is suddenly exploded into the air and basically forms small particles. The other is in the sea. But let's listen to this fireman. You have two 110-story office buildings. You don't find a desk. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. The building collapsed to dust. And lots of dust. In fact, that dust, uh, the, the, the expansion cloud from that dust it takes heat to expand a cloud. You can calculate how much heat that it is, or how much energy it takes. The available gravitational potential in this building, 20-story building, above 80 stories, right? So you can calculate it. It's the weight of, of each floor times its distance above the floor, uh, above the ground. Uh, 110,000 kilowatt hours. Well, that has to go into Four, at least four energy sinks, none of which make any sense, and all of which uh, are calculated, and you can find these in our, in our technical articles uh, the, on our website. The, and, uh, and on 9-11, journal of 9-11 studies.com, a great source for, for uh, this more detailed information. Uh, it, it, it takes three to four times that amount of energy to expand these dust clouds to 10 times the volume of the building in 30 seconds. It takes easily 10 times that amount of energy to create all of this molten metal. It takes more than 10 times that amount of energy to crush 80,000 tons of structural steel as if it didn't even exist at free fall speed. It takes 20 times that amount of energy to pulverize all the concrete and I mean virtually all the concrete. There's no macroscopic chunks of concrete found down at the bottom uh, to dust and to gravel. So uh, the, the, the official uh, fiction does not hold up under any scrutiny. Now, 1,100 victims remain unidentified. Fewer than 300 whole bodies were found. 20,000 pieces of bodies were found. 6,000 small enough to fit into test tubes. 20, 200 pieces matched to one single person. Now this is gruesome at, at a conference like this where we honor the loved ones, but and, until we see the truth and the, and, and, and the facts associated with that truth, we may not readily be able to make the emotional transition to bringing ourselves to do something. Uh, this pisses us off, and that's one of the reasons we look at it, okay? A thousand victims never even identified in other words, they couldn't find something big enough that would fit into a test tube. Uh, so the aircraft impacts, fires, and gravitational collapses, of course, do not account for the pulverization of all of these bodies. Now, I want you to go online and see the, the rest about the fires and how NIST's claimed 1,800 degrees can't even exist by their own information. <clears throat> and this is supposed to be a a roaring hot fire, and here's somebody standing in the hole made by the airplane, waiting for, to be rescued. 
And, and that was only after, uh, after uh, what, half an hour, uh, the, the, the North Tower collapses after 102 minutes. We have 18 floors, uh, or 18 hours of fire, um, over 26 floors that did not bring that fire built down. It's a gross difference. We have uh, fires in the South Tower that were going out by the time the, the collapse initiated. Uh, Chief Oreo Palmer reached the 78th floor, says there's two isolated pockets of fire. We can put it out with two lines. Uh, Brian Clark coming down from above, leading 17 other survivors uh, through the point of roaring inferno, says uh, there were small flames lapping up through the damaged wall. Uh, we're not talking, we're, we're talking about something completely different. This is the test that NIST hired UL to do. It, it, it uh, did not collapse. It, it uh, deformed only three inches. Uh, Fire Engineering Magazine calling the investigations a half-baked farce. A uh, full-throttled, full-resource forensic investigation is imperative. This is the editor of Fire Engineering Magazine, that, which brings all fire protection engineers together. Then we have the NIST report, tasked with explaining how World Trade Center 1 and 2 uh, were, were brought down. But let's look at their objective. The focus of the investigation was on the sequence of events from the instant of aircraft impact to the initiation of collapse for each tower. For brevity in this report, the sequence is referred to as a probable collapse sequence. It stops at the initiation of the first, where the first truss pulls away or pulls in the first column. Everything after that is complete speculation. There's no analysis of how one floor caused another floor to collapse all the way down. Why would they stop before the entire event, the structural behavior of the building, started? Any guesses? Because that's where all of the evidence that I've shown you for controlled demolition occurs. Immediately after that, the first explosion. They can't handle it. They would have to tell, go through all of that information. So that's why Jim Hoffman calls this the three-year, $20 million cover-up of the crime of the century. And you can read his report on our website also, and on his, an excellent series of research, 911research.com. He, he follows all of the, shows you all of the unfounded assumptions, uh, like global collapse immediately follows from in the initiation of collapse. 10,000 pages in this report. It st really stacks up this high. One half of one page on the speculation that says, goes like this. Well, uh, uh, we saw that the, 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 the building below was unable to resist the deformation, uh, by deformation of, of the collapsing building mass above. That's it. I mean, that's the extent of the technical analysis. It's not there. So they have all of these uh, unfounded assumptions that shows you w why the South Tower fell first, claiming, in fact, that there's more core damage in the South Tower than there is in the North. And that's why it collapsed first. It's ludicrous. You can see it's the one that took the glancing blow. It's a tin rat, Kevin Ryan says. They'll never read all this stuff. It's full of um, uh, outrageous lies and, and fudged computer simulations. And you'll have to take a look at it. Now, why does the former chief of NIST's Fire Science Division Dr. Quintier call for an independent review of the World Trade Center investigation. That's pretty damning all in and of itself. So NIST comes back and they said, well, you know, in 2005, yeah, we looked at controlled demolition. Um, that is to say, in answer to some questions that they weren't answering in their initial report, it couldn't have been controlled demolition because it didn't start at the bottom. That's what they said, as if it couldn't be engineered to start at the top. Well, we have interesting set of foreknowledge as well in the Twin Towers, a biochemical attack that FEMA was preparing for in downtown Manhattan the day before 9-11. Tom Kenny says, we arrived late Monday night and went right into action on Tuesday. Hundreds of FEMA volunteers. What a coincidence. Here's Giuliani. I, I went down to the scene and we set up uh, headquarters at 75 Barclay Street, which was right there with the police commissioner, the fire commissioner, the head of emergency management. And we were operating out of there when we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. And 
Ten minutes later... Oh. And it did collapse before we could actually get out of the building. So we were trapped in the building for 10, 15 minutes. Of so he had 10 minutes of warning. And, 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 and did he tell the firemen? Did, maybe he needed a few heroes. We have corroboration from people who worked on the official story themselves. Uh, we have corroboration from Mathis Levy. Uh, a few. We have corroboration from Van Romero, uh, who says, in my opinion, is based on the videotapes that after the airplanes hit the World Trade Center, there were explosive devices inside the buildings that caused the towers to collapse. Mike Taylor looked like a classic controlled demolition. Uh, structural engineer William Rice, the prevailing theory would have us believe that each of the Twin Towers inexplicably collapsed upon itself, crushing all 287 massive columns on each floor while maintaining a free fall speed as if the 100,000 or more tons of structural, supporting structural framework underneath did not even exist. William, would you please just stand? I understand you're with us today. We're Thank you, William. <laughs> William is a member of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, as I hope all of you will be, because when you see this information, you can't come to the conclusion that Al-Qaeda brought these buildings down. Once you arrive at that conclusion, which we've supported with all of this evidence, you're faced with a terrible problem. It doesn't match your worldview or mine. We're hardwired to believe that uh, elements within our government, which I think can only be concluded, had access to these buildings and the means, the motive, the opportunity, and, and, and who benefited, okay? But I didn't say that. I'm an architect. We stick with the evidence. But what we do is we come up with these defensive and avoidance techniques, uh, like our government wouldn't do this to us. I would, I would have heard about it by now. It couldn't be kept a secret, all the people that must have been involved. I'm not an expert in controlled demolition. It's too horrible. I don't even want to think about it. In fact, worse, I didn't even see this stuff tonight. So that happens, and it, this, and it happens unconsciously. You might have to force yourself to look at the video in total, to step your way through this when you have more time, so that you don't become part of the problem by avoiding the debate going back to sleep. You've got to find a way to motivate yourself into action by working through your fears and disbeliefs based on rational reaction to very scientific data, which I believe I've brought to you and Dr. Jones will be bringing to you. You've got to get informed and you have to inform everybody, particularly architects and engineers. We have phone books. They have yellow pages. There's phone numbers in there for every architect and engineer. You can call them and ask them over the phone. Look at this website. Get their email addresses. A lot of email addresses can be found and uh, through, through websites, uh, for, for even for the AIA chapters. It's imperative because we, if we don't get to 1,000 architects and engineers demanding a real investigation, whether it's international or by Congress or private or whatever, we will have serious problems. So our goal is to get there by September 11th, 2008, and we have to have your help. It's absolutely essential. There's, there's, there's just no way around it. Oops. Now, the buildings are a small part of the 9-11 pie. You have to find a way to see the rest of this pie. This is the easiest part of the pie, I think, to present to other people. But whether it's uh, Afghanistan, which was a heroin production for, for uh, before the Taliban got in and after we kicked them out, or the defense debt, oil, and insurance media says, medias, who, industries whose profits soared, or the blocking of the truth of the, of the media and why we don't get the truth because 90% of the media is owned by four corporations and a project Mockingbird, uh, which uh, justifies this, this curious statement by William Colby, the Central Intelligence Agency owns everyone of any significance in the major media. He died shortly after making that statement. And it was a profound statement. It's exposed in books like this, Project Censored, which brings real information. You have to get out and do something because we didn't see the truth. It appears as if our government lied to us about the building collapses. The 9-11 Commission reinforced that lie. 
FEMA and NIST justified it, and the corporate media repeated and hammered it in. So unfortunately, this is just the beginning of a terrible journey that all of us have to take. We have to open our eyes and demand a new investigation, because easily this is the worst attack on Americans um, uh, since uh, Pearl Harbor and, and, and the most horrible attack. We have to do something. We have to follow up. You have to get this DVD, for instance, which is outside. Um, 3,000 of these are now uh, in, in circulation. We need to make it more like 10,000 to get the word out. This is our website. You need to go to it and get yourself informed with these relatively simple little uh, jewels you'll find. There's evidence cards. You have to find other DVDs such as 9-11 Mysteries, 9-11 Guilt, Loose Change, Dr. Griffin's work, uh, uh, Pearl, New Pearl Harbor, uh, debunking 9-11, debunking. And you have incredible support in the 9-11 truth movement as you've seen here today. You have to speak out because a time comes when silence is betrayal. And that time is now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. One more question. I, thank you. I have one, I forgot to ask you guys the, 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 the question, how many of you believe that the Twin Towers in Building 7 were brought down by fires? Anybody, I had one, still, thank you for being honest. Do, is there any others? One, there's one in every crowd and, and if we have a chance for Q&A, I want you to be the first to ask your questions. How many are unsure? Anybody still unsure? One? Anybody else? Okay, good. That's great to have those numbers. Thank you all again so much. We have some, do you mind if we skip the Q&A? We have some no, unique have, developments. Yeah. Uh, we have some uh, some very nice surprises um, that just happened. Uh